Okay, we're going to call this meeting to order. Good evening. Welcome to the City of Montpelier Development Review Board for Monday, April 15th. My name is Daniel Richardson. I serve as the chair of the board. The other members from my right are Rob Goodwin, Kevin O'Connell, Meredith Crandall, staff, Kate McCarthy, Ryan Kane, Tom Kester, Will Shabom. All right, the first order of business is approval of the agenda. Uh, I'll note we only have one item of business for this evening. Um, but are there any additions to the agenda or changes that wish to be board members wish to make? Otherwise, well, let's the take, staff oh. would like to actually make a change if you don't mind, sure. Um, so we have um, representatives from Caledonia Spirits here this evening okay. for other business that would like what? to discuss with the board um, some potential sign options that go beyond what the zoning administrator can approve per figure 3-16 in the Riverfront District, um, as well as a judgment call on whether a particular proposal qualifies as public art. Um, these are both things where my first look is that the answers would be neither would be allowed, but right. they wanted to come and talk to you to see if there's a possibility that you might potentially think otherwise. Okay, and this would fit in as other business. Other business. Unwarned, so we're not looking to make <coughs> This is decision. no decisions, just discussion. Okay. Uh, so with that addition for Caledonia Spirits, uh, simply seeking feedback. Mm -hmm. um, added under, uh, under business, we'll make that subsection A and then make the announcement of the, the next meeting, subsection B of... Item number six, any other changes? Do I have a motion to accept the agenda as amended? So moved. Motion by Kevin, do I have a second? Second. Second by Tom. All those in favor of approving the amended agenda, please raise your right hand. It is approved as agended. Um, the agenda is approved as amended. Uh, no comments from the chair this evening. The approval of the minutes um, oh, other than to congratulate Kate on her award as Planner of the Year, um, I think that's a noteworthy accomplishment and that uh, it should go on the record. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. So, moving on to the approval of the minutes. First, uh, this is from April 1st. Myself, Kevin, Kate, Tom, Ryan, and Rob were all present. Do I have a motion to approve the or amend the minutes? Okay. And what would you like to amend? Do I need a second and then discuss it, or do I just throw out the amendment without a motion? I, I, I think we're sort of at the pre-motion okay. phase. I withdraw my motion. <laughs> um, on page two, the fifth paragraph from the bottom, which begins one of the questions, says the current driveway is about three inches shy of the 36 inches required for two parking spots. That should probably be 36 feet, right? Oh, yep. yeah. yeah. I would pay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for catching the typo. You're welcome. Um, I, I did actually have a question from a member of the public who was a little confused about um, in the second paragraph on that 29 College Street application where it talks about um, my speaking about the AIPUD and that the only thing that needs to be considered are the 2018 regulations. Mm -hmm. um, there were some questions about whether or not the master plan would ever be something that comes up again. And I'm not sure if that's something, I know we discussed it saying, yes, if they go forward, they're gonna need a master plan with a future campus PUD. Mm -hmm. I hadn't put it in the minutes because it doesn't necessarily apply to this application, but somebody raised that question in reviewing the minutes. So I don't know if you wanted me to add it back in or not. Um, it, it's my recollection that we included that neither the AIP, that because the AIPUD did not apply and the master plan was expired, there was not a requirement for that a master plan be in place in order for us to review 29 College Street. Right. Is that the board's recollection? Yes. Right. The question was whether a future master plan would be needed. Oh. And I don't it, know if it we will. discussed or made conclusions about that, so okay. I'm not sure it needs to be reflected in the minutes. Perfect. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. I just wanted to bring it up since some people were questioning me about that. No, thank you. Any other amendments to minutes? Hearing none, uh, I now is time. I think time is ripe for a motion with the amended minutes. So moved. 
Motion by Tom to accept the amended minutes. And do I have a second? Second, Jeff. Second by Rob. All those in favor of ex who are eligible to vote for accepting the amended minutes of April 1st, 2019, please raise your right hand. And they are adopted. Thank you all very much for that administrative approval and work. That brings us to the primary application that is tonight. That is 106 East State Street. The owner applicants are Gary and Allison Shy. If you'll please come to the table. Um, we're not going to swear you in because this is sketch plan. So I'll just go over briefly what the purpose of sketch plan is. So purpose of sketch plan right now is for us to review the application as it's been submitted at this point uh, and give feedback. The purpose is not for testimony or to create a binding decision at this level. We used to, end under the old zoning bylaws, uh, actually make a decision at this point of whether to have a two-part uh, subdivision process afterwards. The new zoning and subdivision regulations do not call for such a decision. So this is strictly a feedback opportunity at this point. However, um, you know, it is an opportunity for you to get a temperature of what the board is thinking and uh, what we're looking for and what issues we see or spot in this application, understanding that this is not binding on either party. Okay? So that said, uh, Mr. Shai, or Ms. Shai, um, if you'd like to introduce the subdivision project. Okay. Um, well, it's a kind of a different kind of a project because everything is existing. It's been there for, I think, since 2009, so it's almost 10 years that I went through the development review process for 106 to become four units and 108 to become four units. So everything's been approved and site plan and parking and it's been occupied and running. So it's kind of an unusual situation. The barn was there and then I just converted it. Um, so in my request for subdivision, I'm really looking for um, one line, one line has been drawn that that leaves the four permanent parking spaces on one on lot two and leaves four permanent parking spaces on lot one. Um, yeah, you can have, you can yeah. introduce that as evidence if you want yeah, at this point. Not okay. evidence, so but little... introduce it to the application. Okay, so here this is a preliminary survey report. Um, the original surveyor, Richard Bell still around and I call him up. So he just got his maps out. He's going to officially see. Good, thanks, Gary. There you go. Thanks. And there's for you. I'm going to ask him if he could just draw this up for this meeting. It, I don't know that it's going to change. He's going to then go out and actually measure everything. I did notice um, the lot size. It says 0.18 and 0.14. But I have the original map that says 0.54 total acreage. So there's a little, there's a number something going on there. So I, so I don't know if that's, I just want to point that out. But, but, that isn't 100 percent accurate but this is a preliminary um, so i have pictures of the structure before before i bought it the barn we're talking about um 108 I mean, I'll just hold it up at the, it was always, it's garage bay and driveway. 
That's what I bought. And they had put asphalt down. Kevin, you were here for when I did all of this. Um, so they had put asphalt down, which raised the level so the, the, the ground was above the sill. So the building was rotting. This corner had dropped like 18 inches and the building was, was on its way out and the foundation was crumbling underneath. And so I got permits to remove the asphalt. I have the development review board document here when I ask can I remove the asphalt and put crushed stone in there and they and design review allowed me to change the roof to put a new roof on because I couldn't replace the historic slate so I did that that was the first step just to try to save the building um, so historically it's always been driveway it's always been stone it's always had ingress and egress from horses to tractors to cars to so that's what it historically always was um, so I removed the asphalt and then we jacked the building up and we saved the building um, and I put the stone on there. So Meredith just brought up a couple issues that she felt there's a couple items open. One item open is there's a question about the fourth unit about some fee and she said we and I, she and I could work on that administratively. But there's, I mean I, I have paperwork and a certificate of occupancy for four units and I have the final documents and then there's something missing. So she and I have to work on that. Um, but the other issue was that there's part of the original site plan. Um, I, I have um, a site plan that I originally had submitted and was approved um, showing the front of the barn to be driveway and I had two parking garages. This is the barn here and there were I was going to maintain two of the garages, so they, we were going to keep it driveway. Then design review came up with an idea at the very last minute to make one of the driveways, one of the parking garages, a vestibule and have the door in there. And when I decided to do that, um, it was suggested that, well, if you're going to do that, why don't you put curb and, and lawn in there? And after looking at it, I, it was after a two-year process, and I just could not take any more time, so I said, okay, and then I looked into it, and <coughs> the building is so far below grade, it's about six to eight inches below the grade of the road, it slants into the building, and that's why it rotted. So I have since, the building now, the slope from the road, it angles, it angles down, and I'm able to create a small um, decline from the barn from the street so it meets about three feet away from the barn so water sheds away so it doesn't run into the foundation and start pulling the sand away from the foundation again. So Tom McCarl sent me a letter and I answered him and said I can't put the curb on there. It's I can't just put the curb there because I can't fill behind it because it will raise it up and it's going to bring the level back into the sill of the building. It's below grade, I can't do that. And I got a letter from him saying I have to do that. And I wrote to the city with all, the, with all of the reasons why I couldn't and I never heard back. And then I asked, well, what do I do? And then I have the letters here where I wrote and said, okay, there's problems, I can't do it. And so I never heard back and it just got unresolved. So. What I'm asking tonight is not to do anything to the barn to change it, to leave it the way it always was, and to not have to do that condition. If I put, if I do put the curb there, I, I will not fill it. I can't fill it. I'm not going to shed water back into the structure. It just can't be done. So I could put the curb there, but the problem is, is people can walk and trip over it. A really good example is right next door. His home, there is curb and lawn, and I just looked at his home today. It's, it's rotting, not rotted, it's rotting. It's rotted because the lawn is up to the sill of his building, and he has to try to deal with that. Um, so what I'm asking is to just amend the, the, the final site plan back to the site plan that showed this being driveway back to the design review also wanted me to maintain that as driveway because it's historic. They had me put the original barn doors back on. I took the garages off 
and I rebuilt, I, we went to the historic preservation, we looked at the pictures of the original barn doors and we recreated them. Now a couple of those are fake, but with the driveway there, it looks like there's, there are, there's movement going in and out. If you block that off, then it looks like they're fake. And design review was, wanted it to be crushed ledge. That's what the original decision was. We put that in. Um, so I'm just asking that the final site plan go back to the November 2010 site plan, which shows it being driveway, and just leave it as driveway and not try to put curbs. So that's, I hope I feel <laughs> Yeah, so, so the just process-wise, um, for doing the subdivision, the key thing is the parking and access. And it's not a hundred percent clear to me that that making this decision is about the site plan amendment would be part of that. But on the other hand to get this cleared up and figure out what might be acceptable since it would be, it's changing a specific condition on a prior permit. So that's not something I can do as a zoning administrator right. um, to get a feel for that so that we can try and get everything wrapped up together in a reasonable amount of time would be good and to just sort of feel the board out as to what might be possibilities for them before we also then go back to Department of Public Works to try to brainstorm a little bit about whether to the, you know, some of the previous issues with here was to try and make sure it's not parking because mm -hmm. the public right of way technically goes all the way up to the carriage barn. Right. Um, and so if there's a way to, that the board might be comfortable doing something to prevent parking there, which I know is a big concern of the Department of Public Works, while still helping the applicant maintain the building. Mm -hmm. So history question in keeping with the process description. Mm -hmm. Did the condition that has been described come out of the de design review committee's review or out of the development? Where did it come the, from? The condition of, for the curbing? For the curbing, and for the, the yard. For that the came from the development review board after the design review committee was done. I, so was it based on the recommendation of the design review committee? That's my recollection. It, it started it started that way. Hold on a second, Mr. Shy. I, I direct the board's attention to the February 20, the, um, sorry, the April, it's actually issued and dated April 5th, 2011, but it's the decision that's in your packet in the back, uh, from the original <coughs> development review board uh, back in 2011, and it says uh, under findings and conclusions six, seven, and eight talks about these particular areas. Um, so it, it may have been born out of the design review committee's um, examination. And don't forget this is back when the design review committee's findings and decisions always came to us. Uh, but this is a design review and a site plan and a variance which was being requested at that time um, and there are there are three findings and conclusions about what the what the application will include so these aren't conditions these were representations of what were accepted so um, and we're we're, con we're part of the decision um, and if you can see the attached maps, I was on the DRV at the time as well, and we had a great deal of discussion, in my recollection, because of the right-of-way issue. And it was the board's feeling at that time, as Meredith has just echoed, um, a concern about the right-of-way. Uh, the fact is that the right-of-way goes up to the front of the building. Having cars park in it creates a great deal of problem. Um, and frankly, is maybe the only place on the street where that, where that occurs um, directly in front of a building. Where the old place where they park? Right, directly oh. in front of the park. Well, 
but That's at least in this at least in this immediate area. I mean, you're just looking at the map. The house next door. Next door. Next door. <coughs> and, um, the State Street just down the street. The people the have a okay. A parking lot exactly the same. And Never from that location, you can see three other. Nevertheless, this is exactly a this was a concern of the boards at the time, and I think it's still a concern, given what. Uh, well, with Todd McArdle in his April first memo basically is saying it hasn't changed and that the that the issue with the right of ways is the same as it's always been so well i sent a letter to the city um dated after that and i explained all of the addresses where it's occurring throughout the city and that this has always been but but no excuse me and and i sent a letter to the mayor to the city and to tom and no one ever answered me. And then I asked, what do we do? What do we do? And I have letters written. And I was ignored. And so I just waited for someone to tell me what to do. And so I didn't ignore anything. I answered with a letter making a statement. And when I pointed next door, and the guy next door, and then I pointed on, on State Street where they have parking right along where there's no sidewalk. It's on Hubbard Street where I live, right across the street, all the cars. Um, Justin Tricotti, his house on Wilder Street, city council member. The parking is right in front of the house and all the cars are lined up. And so we can't. I asked, what do we do about that? And they just, the city ignored my letter and never responded. And so Gary, there's, there's, there's a long history here. It goes over a period of, of at least 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 years. But nonetheless, there's a record of the city trying to work with you, coming up with a reasonable solution, and then we're left here holding the, the, the remnants of your non-compliance. I, I saved a historic building that was Well, that's great. That's crushing. great, but that's I not the issue. I in the community and made more housing. I did 99%, and I would like to bring up, because I feel like, you know, no, I'm, I'm going to speak freely and not worry about making friends. I'm going to speak the truth. There are so many site plans where people, when they actually come down to doing it, weren't able to fulfill them. And I know them throughout the city. The mobile station, I could point them out everywhere. The Chittenden Bank building. And I remember being on committee and coming before the city and saying, we were on, at those public hearings and we got concessions and we got a site plan. and. Now they're not following it, and it was in good faith. It was a minor change. It wasn't significant, and so there's site plans throughout the city that are not 100% fulfilled, and so I brought that up to the city, and I asked them about my problems and about the drainage and that it's going to rot the building again, and I that's why it rotted, and, and so I've acted in very good faith. I've invested in this community. I've added apartments and saved that building. The Union Institute, it was parking garages. They took the historic doors off and put regular car garages there. And the whole building was like leaning and they put asphalt there that was crumbling, it was ugly. Cars parked there constantly for decades and decades. And then, you know, I have permitted parking spaces out of the right of way on my site plan. But people have a boyfriend. People someone visits i've had people and i've told them no you can't park you're going to get towed and this i said it would be nice if maybe the city would ticket them like could ticket but they no one enforces anything and i and then i don't even know who's car. <laughs> i've tried i've had people parking i'm trying to find out whose it is people from the street park there the neighbor will park there um it's all, it always was parking, and people are into that habit. Um, I think that if the city wished to enforce this as a problem, it would be good if they would go to the city council and ask the police department to go around in cars that are less than one foot from the street to just let people know, like this is a warning, and then give people tickets so that I don't have to be the parking place. But I think that to put all the responsibility on me, on the historic driveway that's always been a driveway and to start policing it. I've never seen a problem. It wasn't a problem for the hundred years that the college owned it. It hasn't ever been a problem. The plowing, the I haven't ever witnessed a problem. 
And so I'll put the curve, if you want, I'll put the curb and I'll put a little bank of dirt there because I'm not going to fill it to the house. I, I'm not going to do that, but I could throw some grass down. <coughs> but it doesn't seem, it seems like on what I'm asking is not to change the historic building and leave it the way it's always been. And but you, you've, I'm you've changed the building. historic building. It's no longer a garage. It's apartment buildings. The whole purpose of having entry and exit when it's a garage makes sense, but it doesn't when it's an apartment building. And back in 2011, when we had this discussion, the idea was to create a yard for this and no longer have these parking directly in front of the building. And as before, um, you know, you represented that you could you could do this and that this could become a lawn and curbing could be put in. So. I, I, I'm only one board member, um, but I'll give you a very strong indication of where I'm coming from is that, um, you know, I don't see it as, and there's a landscaping component to subdivision as well. Um, I, I don't see this as its use as being a driveway anymore. You, you've changed it to apartments. This front of the building has to reflect that. Um, okay. Because of the right of way issues, I think that creates an ongoing problem with this lot. And given that your proposed drawing um, has actual parking places, creating a lot um, will be important where that parking is used as opposed to the front yard being turned into, into parking. And that's, uh, I think that's consistent with both the way we've done the subdivision uh, bylaws and the way in which this particular lot um, has been viewed. Uh, so the idea of keeping this as a driveway doesn't make sense anymore. Okay. Um, and so, you know, there are, part of our review here is simply to look at what these lots are gonna look like after, if we grant a subdivision application. And I think this is one of those key areas where this is, you know, it doesn't prevent us from looking at this as a subdivision application. If you want to come back to us and you want to make this argument which you started to make of saying I want to I want to turn I want to keep this as a driveway I, I, I'm not receptive to that argument again I'm only one well, board I think, member. I, I think we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves I mean that the application here is for a subdivision I think what Meredith was saying is it may make sense to address these and I heard a request for an amendment to the site plan but if you want to amend the site plan we need a site plan amendment application and then we can consider it. I mean, but as of right now, the previous site plan has requirements that were unappealed, includes a curb and some grass. If you want to change that, you need to go through the legal process to change that. And this subdivision application is not that process. Yeah, one, one possibility though, if, if we are thinking landscaping with regard to subdivision, and part of that is also in, in front, not just privacy, mm -hmm. If there was a discussion of maybe having some landscaping in this front, what's what's driveway and what you submitted versus what's yard from the approved that was approved in the prior permit, you know, if we wanted to add landscaping up there, would that almost be a combined subdivision and site plan amendment request, or would they be no, two separate I think, still? I, I don't. I think Ryan's actually correct right? in yeah. in noting that you know as an unappealed final yeah. subdivision um, we can't we can't backdoor in mm -hmm. uh, changes to the existing permit yep. but it would still need to it would still need to come here because it was a I, well it wasn't I, a condition it was a finding it was right? it becomes a condition all the factual findings of that yeah. nature become conditions of the permit what yeah. the applicant yeah. proposes so it would need to come here yeah i mean and i think still. for purposes of this subdivision what we have I think, you know, that's interesting because what's on the ground certainly doesn't comply with what is legal, what's permitted, what the, the existing site plan says, which is a curb and grass. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I mean, if it were in fact grass, if it did in fact comply, I think we could require landscaping or su suggest landscaping be placed in that grassy area. Mm -hmm. um, as, as the chair was suggesting we might do. But mm -hmm. yeah. at the end of the day, I think it's up to the applicant to determine 
you either you either need to figure out a way to come into compliance with the prior approval or you need to seek an amendment of that it, and I think it makes sense within this process because you're here you're getting the subdivision that we could certainly we do it all the time where we hear multiple applications together mm -hmm. we could have the final subdivision application and the uh, site plan amendment just all at one hearing where we can kind of look at all this together and that could be a way to to just kind of get through the process a little bit more quickly just a suggestion is totally up to you how you want to do that and it's you know I, but I don't I'm I'm a little cautious of us starting to talk about uh, you know what we'd comfortable with as far as site plan amendments and not when it's when we haven't had a proposal mm -hmm. you know and it's up to you if it's a something you know more than what's currently there but less than what was previously required then that's what we'll consider you know if that's what you propose if it's nope I want to keep it exactly as it is on the ground right now then that's what we'll consider but I don't really think it's wise to get into it until we have an, an application for something I'll stop talking now that's fine to say something if I could sure uh, um, you made a very good point and to be honest I, I wish you had made that point to me I would have you're right I did change the building it's not a garage anymore it's not a storage building it's for people living there coming and going and you made a very very good point so I mean I'm willing to meet the criteria of the original plan um, like you know I'm not I may not be able to go all I can't go above the sill of the structure but it can be a yard and I could get some kind of something growing there and we could landscape it and, um, yeah, I just go ahead. so I'm just wondering if I meet the criteria, um, are there any other issues? Because I think hearing Dan um, and Kevin have made some points that maybe that's my past. Um, yeah. I'm glad we're having this because it's a good so discussion. Yeah, not that's a formal one because yeah. you're getting the ideas to come back to you with. So. Gary, yeah, have, you, have you seen the uh, April 1st uh, memo email from Tom McArdle? Where he suggests I've, yeah, I've seen that, yeah. Okay. Yes, I have it right, right here. Right. <coughs> well, um, I'd be glad Go to ahead. talk more about that. I want to reflect back something based on what, what Dan said, and, and I also heard your concern about the, an interest in the historic nature of the building. Um, and say, say, you know, maybe the driveway is historic in some way, but I would just point out that on the 2011 site plan, which has the yard and crushed stone proposal that came out of the design review committee's conversation with you and so I think perhaps that gives some assurance that, um, that they're very historic minded too so if it's okay with them it's probably okay to, to really demarcate that shift from being a garage to apartments like like Dan was saying so I, I think it makes sense from a historic preservation perspective if it's okay with the DRC um, I think you can feel good about it <laughs> I think also I, I did a lot of different things with the building and steps. First, I had to save the structure. So I proposed removing the asphalt and putting crushed ledge. And they said, fine. No one said make it a yard, like keep it, make it a driveway. So everyone was happy that it was a driveway. And then when I started saving the building and then it looked like we could save it and it so it evolved. So well, it also sounds I've been like been through a lot of process. So yeah. but in the end it's apartments. Dan, I think your point was very strong and you're right, the DRB, the DRC did end up yeah. saying they're okay with it being yeah. like that. We know historically it's been driveways on. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that shift also came when you went from two to three apartments. So there was actually an intensification of the use that might have said, led them to say, oh, there's, we've got to be a little more careful about how this driveway is demarcated because with more use in the building, there might be the temptation to park, et cetera. So, yeah, it, it has definitely evolved. evolved. Yeah. 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 <coughs> So, Kevin, I didn't want to take you off the train of thought, but I wanted to not lose that. Really, the, my, my, my point was that I just wanted to make sure you had that. Of course, of course, DPW's interest is in making sure that the engineering factors work well and uh, retaining the services of a competent uh, engineer might really serve you well in this. I'm sure Tom's been recommended. I'm sure you could. So, you know, I guess two further things. Um, touching on Ryan's point, 
uh, I think you have to make some decisions with Meredith about how you want to proceed because there's the issue of the front yard um, and the compliance issue with that. There's also the units um, for yep. zoning purposes. I know you've received building permits for all four units as far as certificates of occupancy. Yeah, all this, everything. Yeah, but I, I wasn't which aware that something might have been missed. I, I'm, that's why I think it's in Meredith and you can work out how you want to proceed, but those seem like to, um, so if you, if you don't, if you're going to come into compliance with the 2011 permit as opposed to seeking to change the 2011 permit, then, then that's much easier. Then I think we can probably take that and she may have some additional information she wants from you as far as the amendment because um, by adding the additional units, you are amending the 2011 because I was looking at that. That's only two units uh, which were granted at that time. I know it's been bumped up to three by administrative amend. Yep, it was an administrative amendment and to bump the units up to three and we don't have to worry about site plan changes mm -hmm. with those so much um, because since all of that happened, we had the 2018 regs which reduced the parking requirements. Right. And so I think just coming into, com coming into compliance on paper on the fourth unit and then um, uh, that way it's, we're counting the right number of parking spaces that you need. Um, and then, so there's those issues that I think you can work with Meredith about. And then when you come back, obviously, we want to see um, if you are keeping the landscaping in front. One of the, or the, as 2011 talked about with the, with the permit, with the yard and the curb, um, we'd want to see a landscaping plan as part of your subdivision proposal just to see how that's going to comply and one of the issues that we as I was indicating before that we look at are is landscaping as part of the um, subdivision application permit some of it at least I don't think is going to necessarily be relevant here which is we usually encourage the applicants to put in landscaping that that helps uh, reinforce the subdivision between the properties giving privacy to both but in this case, since there's a shared driveway, that may not be as practical. Um, but uh, I think we will want to see we want to see the the sort of plans that either what you have existing now and what you're proposing to add um, or change. The um, as I understand, the proposed parking from this map is going to be, the actual spots are going to be on the new, the new lot that you're creating with the, with the barn. Is that right? Yeah, the, the site, the, the, the parking spaces that were indicated on the site plan, they're, yeah, I mean, they exist. So those, right. are, those are what, so the line he drew was where the existing, because they, obviously they have to be unobstructed so they weren't, crossing each other anyway. But and it, it's it's interesting that line as far as frontage and all the other requirements work very well. Mm -hmm. So they happen to be in the right space. And so you know obviously one of the things you're gonna have to work out just with whoever you sell one I don't know which lot if you're gonna keep both or if you're gonna sell one or both. Um, but you'll you know and we don't need to necessarily see it but there at least one thing that sticks out to me is you know, there's going to have to be some sort of easement with the shared driveway. I spoke uh -huh. to um, Richard Bell, and I said he, he understands the regs, uh -huh. and like he might meet with Tom, Tom McArdle, and go over the right of way requirements so that people can move in if they have a moving van, people backing up there. He was proposing almost that the parking area defined would all be right of way, and that the property line would still be there mm -hmm. but that so that people can be free to back in and go into their space that that would be a common that the, the parking lot would have the right of ways in it right and, and that was his first suggestion but he is writing all of this up and then i think tom it would be good if tom and Meredith mm -hmm. took a look at it and made sure that it mm -hmm. all of the 
requiring space of backing out and going into those kinds of things. Right. I think those are the the big preliminary issues. I mean, you know, other than it meets the the minimum as you point out, it's existing houses. You're not proposing any new. Um, nor, given the slopes, is this be difficult to put anything behind these houses. This goes pretty. If my memory serves me. It goes pretty it's down, pretty steep. Beautiful back there already. Right. Deer and everything. Oh, nice. Um. Any other questions for any of board members? I have a further parking question. So um, I don't know if you have a copy of our staff report. Um, on page seven, there's an image that looks like it's the parking area <coughs> between the barn and the house. <coughs> the parking area that straddles the property line we were just talking about. So it's on page seven. And so I was looking at that and trying to count six or seven spaces to kind of match up what's on the site plan with what's in this picture. And it looked like one and a half of the spaces are not really functional, kind of overgrown. So um, uh, update on the status of that, maybe. There are three there. Yeah. Someone, people don't always have cars, and someone wanted to, I have a garden, and they wanted to plant there, and they ended up making it a garden, a garden space, using it. And hmm. it seemed like people just didn't need to park there. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it looks nice not having that many cars, and so, you can you can park there. It's but it's it's garden, so you could to the left you could uh -huh. pull there. And are you talking about next to the barn? Are you talking um in front of on the side of the barn or I'm looking at perpendicular to, to that. I, let's see, it would be on lot one, right on the line. I see a fence that if you follow the line of the fence out, there's kind of a cluster of plants in the oh, middle that, of the asphalt. Yeah. So that would make it hard to park there. Well, there's, there are these three, these three people are using there. There's one, two, three places on the on the side of the structure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see on the side of the structure. Right. But then yeah. the site plan also indicates that there are three more spaces up here. Yeah, That's they. Correct. Yeah, the, okay. Is there room for them? Yeah, That's there's correct. people yes. parking there okay. now. They're parked there. Now. Yeah. Okay. Just, oh, I, was I was just interested. going by the picture, and it looked really small. It looked overgrown. Yeah. It's not overgrown. No, it's. There is a lilac really there that wide. I trimmed. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, people, people all park the way there, yeah. forward. Okay. And there's room for everyone to get in and out okay. next to the barn. Okay. Yes. Okay. I just wasn't sure what I was seeing, and, and there was a staff note about whether the yep. parking lot in practice was the same <coughs> as the parking lot on the. I'm, I'm all for gardens, but um, just want to make sure that you got what you got. When the only you're one that's a little different is the far left one on lot one. Mm -hmm. There's people pushed in and wanted to do garden and they weren't parking there and I'm like whatever. But it's a parking space. Mm -hmm. But it is part you could park there. Okay. So I guess in the final site plan we would need um, just assurance about that and also um, whatever the parking uh, dimensions are supposed to be. Is it eight by eight and a half by eighteen? Nine by eighteen? Eight and a half. By 18. Eight and a half feet by, oh. by 18 feet. And we yeah, just, just like to see that kind of measured out on the site plan. Yep, the, and that would be my suggestion. Well, not even just for the site plan, but for the survey to make sure that's all surveyed out. Yes, surveyed out. Make sure you've got all the feet you need. Thanks. Good. Any other questions or issues that other board members want to? Any other questions from the applicant? Okay, well, I mean, I think you have a, a read on where we're at and how the various ways you can proceed. So we'll look for the final application at some point. Well, thank you. All right. No, uh, Thanks. No, it was a very good, I, I understand, and you made a very good point. Touch base with me, we'll set up a meeting to strategize. Yeah, we'll take the next steps. Yes.
Thank you, everybody, for your time. Oh, that's thank true. You. Thank you. That is true. You're right. Thank you. Thank you. If you look at if you look at external uh, costs, you're, I I could see that that you could make a pervasive argument. Yeah. And they look they look great. Please come forward. Uh, if you just introduce yourselves for the record. Of course. Four names. <laughs> so I'm Ryan Christensen uh, with Caledonia Spirits. This is my colleague, Anna Bromley. We're here for advice. So, as hopefully you guys know, we are uh, moving in on Perry Street. Mm -hmm. uh, we're about a couple months away from oh, thanks. We're getting really excited. Excited about uh, signage. Um, when we chose this neighborhood, we were incredibly excited about sort of the industrial nature of the granite shed. So we, we designed this building uh, to kind of fit into that uh, industrial granite shed. And, um, we were hoping that we could design a facility that was beautiful, but also sort of um, put a light on the, the, the beauty of the neighborhood that we're moving into. Um, at the same time, we still wanted to look and feel like a distillery from all angles. So, when you look across the river, it clearly looks like a distillery. You see the, the, the grain silos. Um, in the big window, you're going to see the, um, the big uh, still. And it's still mm -hmm. but it's like five and a half top of hot still. It's going to be beautiful. Um, well, she's already beautiful, but she's going to be beautiful in Montpelier now. Um, the challenge that we're having is on the other side, on the north side, facing Barry Street. And when we designed this facility, we didn't realize how visible it was going to be from, from Barry Street. So, if you look from the, uh, the west, like the second photo here, this is down on Granite Shed Lane. We're really happy with how this came out. It truly looks like just another granite shed along the way, uh, which we think fits in quite well. Um, but if you look from the um, from the north, there's just this big gray wall, and um, that doesn't really scream distillery. We really want to let people know that it is a distillery. Um, so we've looked at sort of some signage plans. We looked to um, sort of the communities that understand distillation best, like Scotland and, and Kentucky. And we've got some examples here um, that just kind of show sort of the language and how they communicate um, to the distillery. And we think that we have an opportunity to do something very similar. Of course, that doesn't necessarily meet the zoning regulations of Montpelier. So cruise through these. We can we can stop at any any particular photo, but these are really just sort of inspiration as we travel around the world and see the distillers that we love, what we want to bring into Montpelier. So, and then additionally, you know, there, there are some some um, examples in even in Montpelier of, you know, big sort of signs that kind of represent the use of the building, like the restaurant sign over, over Necky and the garage on the, the wonderful garage building of Fine Julio's. Um, so what we're proposing is that on, on the Barry Street side, we could add, and this is just Photoshop on there, of course, but just some uh, uh, lettering that says still something that really speaks to the agricultural use of the building and lets people know that this granite shed is not like all the other granite sheds and there's something, something more interesting going on inside. So as Mary said, we're not looking for an approval, we're looking for sort of a discussion we feel like it would be a missed opportunity to not be able to do anything interesting on the side of that building because it is a big gray wall and quite frankly we didn't think it would be so visible from Barry Street and now there's, there's a big gray wall there that we want to break up. Break up and in add to the community a little bit. And also let the tourists that are looking for talent and the spirits know that hey, they, they found it. Are you looking just to paint on distillery on the side of the building? I think so. Would that be paint? We're open to all material okay. suggestions, paint or, or metal or And, and quite honestly, my personal preference would be that it would look a little more distressed and old. You know, like it might not really, it's not supposed to be the most visible thing. It's just supposed to be um, sweet to sort of use it. Would this be illuminated at night or is it just, just have it up still, during the day if you drive by, you see it and at night, maybe you could see it. From the road, but you're not looking to put like outdoor lighting or anything like that. To Definitely not no, okay. there. I mean, honestly, I would look at. Um, uh, here we go. Three, three zero. Particularly the best. Um, does the state's billboard law only apply from a state or federal highway? From not a state, the billboard law is, is um, tied 
to somebody else's land. Offsite advertising. So the the maximum sign area and height requirements are in Figure 3-16, which is on page 3-35 in the zoning regulations in Part 3. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers we came up with for the total square footage when we calculated all of the facade widths, um, but the the distillery sign on its own because you have to measure with a rectangle drawn around the sign elements, mm -hmm. um, I think was much in excess of what the total signage allowance was for the whole building. What is the current ma maximum? Uh, well, I can explain how we came to our math. Yeah. On the last page of the presentation here, um, we measured the linear square feet of all but the west facing facades, um, which we mean public facing facades, um, and times that by 0.3 square feet. So we uh, calculated The proposed signage that we have here already, the mm -hmm. hexagons and keys and the gables and then the bar hole above the door, add up to about 90 square feet currently. Um, and yes, you're right that the proposed distillery sign on its current size, um, which is all, but you know, not, not determined as it So uh, that answers half my question. The other half was what is allowable? Wait, so, so that's what that was the first number she gave. Mm -hmm. Right now on this building, 165.9 square feet okay, is what is allowed on the entire building. All sides of the building. Um, you, so, a facade is defined, and this isn't going to be 100% accurate, as the front of the building, and the way it's written right now, you can also include side sides of the building that face a public area. Um, and it's kind of loose, so I've been defining that with some flexibility. Mm -hmm. And the way this building is built and presented, really, you've got the front, which is towards the parking where their main entrance is, which is one of the shorter sides, and both of the long sides really face public areas. One is on the river, and one is on, um, it's not directly on, but you can see the whole length of it mm -hmm. from um, Berry Street. And if I can just point out that um, most of the, the Kentucky and, and Scotland photos, those are brand names. We're not asked by it to be able to put Caledonia Spirits. We're, you know, it's more the use of like the restaurant sign, the garage sign. It's, it's really just an indication of what's happening on the inside. But we're really not trying to say, we don't, we don't want to say Caledonia Spirits in the biggest possible way we can. I think the content of the sign would be irrelevant to our determination. Yeah, we're not supposed to actually regulate content. Which is a little weird considering we have a public art exception to signs, but which has to do with sort of the content. And, and just so we understand, what yeah. is the parts around signs? Where is the public arts exception? Uh, the public, so public art is, um, is defined, it's a definition. Um, so public art is defined on page 5 15, so it's section 5101.p sub 8. Mm -hmm. Um, what and page, what page is it? so 5-15 um, so that's how you, where public art is defined in the definition of sign um, the definition of sign specifically excludes uh, public art and that's on the next page 5-16 and public art um, specifically uh, does not identify or draw attention to a business profession or industry to the type of product sold, manufactured, or assembled, or the t to the type of services or entertainment offered or available on the premises. So I don't think the distillery can be thrown in as public art and get the exception. I know that there was a discussion at one point about maybe doing art on the side of the building and not just the distillery sign. Is that correct, Still, that that might still be a possibility? Yeah. Would that even become a tricky line to walk if it has to be art that mm. is art but does not identify or draw attention to the business profession or right. industry or content sold. And I know that there was there was just some of the fun out of it for you. Mm -hmm. We wondered for instance if we wanted to mural bees and things mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. hive. Does that constitute advertising services offered there? Mm. And uh, yeah, it was <laughs> leaning <laughs> towards <laughs> yes, unfortunately as a zoning really? administrator it would 
it, you know, it, it, it runs into problems. Uh, yeah, and that's, I don't know. That's one reason I brought the discussion here. Well, the, the easy line is... Yeah, I mean, all, all, I right know. now, the, I mean, uh, distill, the word distillery is very clearly no, no doubt about that I hear. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I will say that whenever there's any sort of ambiguity in regulations to be resolved in favor of the free use of land. Yeah, and that goes towards that, being able to do the actual art mural. Yeah, so like bees, right. yeah. I, I would be comfortable with bees. Okay. I would not be comfortable with like bottles of gin, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I, so that's, I mean, but it, it is subjective, and it's like I think we'd have to like have a proposal and and kind of review it, but um, or or, a, or appealed have, permit. You'd have to uh, review it. Yeah. Well, and I, I, if I understand this this exemption to the exemption, um, exemption to the exemption, which under not eight C is it's really trying to avoid the advertising billboard quality. Yeah. Uh, so as Ryan suggested in one hypothetical, if you had the different bottles of gin that you sell or spirits, you know, shown there on your mural, that might run afoul of this because it's, it, it's con contrary to this limitation and it's essentially advertising unless, as opposed to you know, um, mural of bees and honey and hives and uh, even some of the, I would say even some of the sort of, you know, you think of these art murals that would de depict the distillation process or something like that, like a Thomas Cole type thing. Um, I mean, that's different than advertising uh, drawing attention to the to the product um, because in some ways you know the definition is talks about b business profession or industry to the type of product sold manufactured or assembled um, I, mean, I really see that as something where you can't advertise so you couldn't it's a limitation on advertising not a limitation on the art itself so like the mural up at I understand. Sorry. That's just my, that's just that's just my offering. It is otherwise, it's it's somewhat meaningless as a um, uh, as an exemption, um, you know, because you would not want to put a mural celebrating dairy cows or milk production on your building <laughs> that doesn't do that um, or you know doesn't necessarily tie into the theme. Um, but that said, I mean, I think that's Ryan's absolutely correct that you can't, we couldn't go too far down that road without something specific. Um, that's just my, and obviously we're going to have different interpretations as to the degree of that on the board and what each board member is comfortable with. Um, but I guess I would offer that my sense in first, re in first cut at reading this is very much it's a, it's a, it's a restriction on sort of backdoor advertising. Um, and calling it a mural, um, as opposed to something that is more uh, artful, uh, public art. Can, can I play with this idea a little bit with a hypothetical ahead. example that is not direction? Um, if you were to do some pollinators and some flowers and accessories like their habitat, the rest of their habitat, would that, I, I'm just thinking out loud, would that identify or draw attention to a business profession or industry? No, it would draw attention to a building. Would it draw attention to the type of product sold, manufactured, or assembled? No, not the products. Or to the type of services or entertainment offered or available on the pre premises? It wouldn't tell you whether there's a restaurant inside or a manufacturing facility or something else. So I sort of, there's sort of a generic nature to a landscape that I wonder if it could maybe meet this definition of public art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think so. I'm I, just I playing think with that would, idea. Mm -hmm. I think if, you, if someone just looked at it in isolation with no context as far as what it was, if they would say, looks like that's like a gin distillery advertisement, or not. And if they say, ooh, it looks like some pretty bees and flowers, then I think it's art, um, regardless of whether or not it's kind of tied in. 
You get like Green Mountain <coughs> Coffee Roasters if they have Camel's Hump and the Green Mountains, which are like prominently featured on all of their labels. Like as a mural, you wouldn't say, oh, a mural of the Green Mountains is now, you know, not public art. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, I mean, I, I have a very specific idea in mind, only um, we, you know, because we're, we're grasping at straws, but in Los Angeles, every movie and television studio, on the outside of their building, plasters their shows, the posters of their shows, all along the outside of the building. <coughs> so if they have an Avengers movie, it's coming out, the big Avengers poster on the outside, and, you know, it's to promote their product. And that's what I interpret this subsection C to really stop is that kind of sort of outward advertising where where it's not really art any longer it's it's really pictures that advertising pictures at that point um, and I think that's there's obviously a, I think it's Kate's description is, is quite accurate as to what is likely to be permissible and um, or at least in, on first blush. And what I'm suggesting is that I think the, the line, it's not like she's not taking us straight up to the, to the line. And I think there's a, a little bit of a gray area in there. And, and if you're thinking about principles that guide you as you're, as you're plotting this, at least from the art, which we're talking about the public art, which isn't actually the picture you, you brought before us, but nevertheless has captured our imagination. Um, but the, uh, you know, the idea is that it, it, it forms an actual artistic mural or drawing or illustration um, as opposed to um, advertising. Um, and I think there's some, there's some very clear lines that could be drawn and some, some grayer lines uh, that you could press against this because we really haven't had to deal with this exemption before. But I think it's also only fair to you to also talk about the word distillery on here. And, you know, if I understand correctly, would you be looking for a, like an exemption to the sign limit to put the distillery on? The word? Okay. <laughs> I am not sure you do. There's no waiver provision in the signs provision. Um, and and this is why, why pardon? Do we know why not? We never have. We've never really had a, a waiver provision for these signs. Yeah, um, the sign allowance, I think, has pretty much always been the sign allowance. Were there any waiver? Correct. Were there any waiver provision? I don't know that there were any waiver provisions at all in the last round of zoning regulations. No, no but well, but even it's in the new regulations they added in waivers, but then it also says, you know, where authorized. Right, where authorized, as in there there the different provisions right. within the 2018 regs. No, yeah. Different provisions have waiver subsections to them, but the sign doesn't. Why, yeah. yeah, and in fact, under three thirty twelve C number fourteen. You know, has a sort of catch-all that is prohibited. Any sign that's not otherwise allowed under these regulations is, effe is effectively prohibited. Um, there's yeah. also the there's zoning regulation um, corrections or tweaks, if you want to call them that, that have been going on right now. Correct. Correct. And that's another place you could take the argument um, that they could give us that authority. They, mm -hmm. they may or may not agree with. With, with you, but that would be perhaps worth it, worth a try. Yeah, there's. I, I wonder if one reason that the sign section is written pretty tightly is there's been so much federal case law around signage, yes. First Amendment, uh -huh. and that if adding a waiver provision, even for cool ideas, hmm. it just adding that discretion could put the city at risk of complying with some of those things perhaps. I'm speculating, I don't know the motivation of the planning commission or the consultant when they did that. But. I, I know that there has been a push by the planning director to work on the sign section, on section 3012, um, and the planning commission didn't want to dig into it this go around. Mm -hmm. 
because the whole thing is probably going to need to be reworked. Right. Um, so if you wanted to try and argue in the near term to make changes to this section, it would have to be in front of city council in the next couple of months. The, um, I mean, the other the other problem, and I'll just throw this out conceptually, it's not your problem. It's just one of the issues here is that, you know, traditionally when we've had sign issues, and we used to as a board approve all the signs, yeah. now most of them are done administratively. Um, but there was always issues not with a well thought out design like what you're proposing, but something that was less well thought out um, or uh, self-illuminated or, I mean, I, there's a good example in that the Domino's sign on, uh, on Berlin Street is accidentally oversized. It was an administrative snafu, um, but every time I pass it, <laughs> It looks so big it compared to the other signs. And it is not your imagination. It's, it's, it's an administrative snafu uh, that created it. But, um, you know, it doesn't fit in with the rest of the signs and the rest of the quality. And, you know, what I think we've always struggled with is how do we let in a very a good design that in some ways makes sense and is consistent with the history as you've put together. I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is kind of like Gin Lane redo. <laughs> um, but where you have a, you know, where you have a history of doing things this way in the industry, and now you're butting against um, a sort of tradition in Montpelier of not letting these kind of signage uh, exist. And, and the question is, I don't think, I, my honest take is that we don't have the tools as much as we'd, we'd like to help you with the distillery sign at this point in time. That doesn't mean that it can't happen. And I think as Meredith's pointing out, the sign issue needs to be worked out. And it's not unreasonable for you to say, this is something very good that we want to do. And it's reasonable. Um, and we should be allowed to do it. Um, that's why we have a planning commission that changes the bylaws and the rules. It's just that when I look at it, we don't exactly have that. And so, you know, the building's not going anywhere either. Um, and if you don't have the distillery sign on it in the first year, it, you know, maybe the second year, you can, exactly, you know, you, you've invested now a fair, fair amount into the footprint. Um, but I, you know, and I think that's where that's where you're likely to have more luck. Now, if you wanna, if you wanna talk about in public art, like a mural kind of design, you know, that you don't want to wait or don't want to risk that sort of political change. I mean, I think you've gotten you've gotten us excited about the yeah. idea of public art, and we have many opinions. And you know, something like that could easily be, um, you know, move forward. And I do see an avenue there within the public art exemption. And if Meredith felt like, well, I want to bring this before the board for approval, that it qualifies as public art, I think we're receptive as a board to that idea um, and seem to have plenty of our own, um, which you're very, you're welcome to <laughs> ignore completely. You've got a great palette there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, whether it be bees or, you know, whatever else we wanted to. Um, that's up to you, but I think we're receptive to it. I think I think what I'm trying to do is just make sure to, that you know we're not just occupying a s safer area. That I think there's a gray, you know, up to the, for this subsection C of the definition, where you know something short of advertising, um, and how far short of advertising? I think that's where you'd have to get into the nuts and bolts and specifics. Um, but we're certainly willing to talk and and. Uh, and have that discussion. That's great. I think in regards to the distillery sign, where would our first step be? Planning commission? I think so. I think if if I think planning commission would be one place to go. I think you also, you know, if you're trying to do this more promptly, you would need to get before city council as well. And you can I, I don't remember the dates right off the top of my head, but shoot me an email. Um, and I'll let you know when that's going to go, when the current changes are going to go before city council. 
Um, so Planning Commission didn't give any substantive suggestions to changes to the sign provision to the City Council for this next round of changes that's going forward. Um, you know, there's a possibility because there, there, there's going to be some minor changes to it, so it's still open. City Council can make further changes if they want. Just I think you want to talk to both. Yeah, and I mean, but I mean, the one thing is you'd have to have specific language that you'd be proposing at that time to allow. That's true. Um, so Planning Commission. It, I, I, what I guess I would probably talk about is, you know, you're a prominent project within the city. Um, and, you know, there are, the planning commission is the one that holds the power to make these kind of changes. And I think if you let them know about this problem, I mean, often the planning commission is motivated by, they're, they're in the unenviable position of sitting there trying to sort of think things out in the abstract. And if you can give them a very concrete example and, and really a presentation along the lines of what you're showing us here, um, I think that makes for a very powerful and persuasive uh, point. Um, obviously, if you had specific sort of regulatory language, and that may be helpful if you talk to Mike and to Meredith, you know, to say, here's the issue. Do you, do you have any examples or do you have any ideas as to what this would look like as far as something that would allow us to do this and then go before the Planning Commission? I think that then makes a very powerful conversation. But I'm, it's that's my sense here is and strictly as just more of a citizen than actual uh, actually as a DRB member. Um, I think that they're the ones that can make the changes. Now, if the city council reviews this as well, I mean, they're the ones who get to make the final decision as to what's in and what's out. And I think that's what Meredith is suggesting is that if there's specific language, the city council is the one who ultimately reviews makes the makes the final call um, but it may start with a conversation with Meredith and Mike only because I think the planning commission depart as a planning department is often motivated by the, the ongoing needs as opposed to sort of abstract ideas and so if you bring this specific need to them that may help motivate um, everyone to make these changes so that you can move forward so sorry to have to make you take two steps back before you can go forward. But, um, but at least as far as the distillery idea, I see that as your clearest path, not, not coming before us okay. yet. Great, thank you. Good. Good luck with that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So hopefully uh, we'll see you again. In June. Thank you all. Thank You're you. Thank you. Okay. Any other business board wishes to discuss? Hearing none, uh, I will just simply note that our next regularly scheduled meeting is for Monday, May 6th, uh, 2019 at 7 p.m. That'll be our first May meeting. Meredith, what's uh, what's the schedule shaping up to be? Um three applications two of which are steep slopes yeah, under the new steep under slope. the, the new steep <laughs> slopes provision with under the interim what area of town oh <laughs> <laughs> well uh, north street is one of them i won't be here on this side i'll be sitting over there for okay, okay. so we've okay. got north street and then um uh upper main okay. That actually reminds me of one other piece of business, uh, Will. This is your last meeting. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for serving on the board and pleasure. your service to making us uh, a better a better board. Yeah, maybe someday I'll be back. You know. Uh, it sounds like it's you're been a couple of years now. Yeah. It's been fun. Yeah. So, you, we always need good anchors, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but as so, I said, you know, I'll be I'll be here at the next meeting, and you know, probably more and more after that. And, so. Good. Great. Well, good luck yeah. on all those endeavors. Uh, anything else? Hearing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second. Second by Kate. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thank you.